Today we're going to look at the second part of Joseph and a few things that I've picked up in this study that um, I found quite interesting and I, hopefully I can share it on to you and make you change your mind a little bit as well. So today we're going to look at the story of Jonas, Joseph, Genesis 42 to 45 and the title for that part is Joseph the Provider. Now in just recapping quickly what happened in study one, in the modeling phase we had where Joseph was one of 12 brothers loved by his father so much that his other brothers hated him and later consp conspired to kill him. And then Je Benjamin being his only blood brother and where Reuben made a plan to save Joseph from being killed. He suggested, let's just throw him into an empty pit and then with the with the idea that he can go back later and save Joseph. But that didn't plan out as he thought, and his other brothers decided, why kill him? Let's make money of it and sell him to the Canaanites, which later sold him then to the Egyptians. Now, one thing we're going to need to look at is where Joseph had his first dream, where he said to his brothers, listen, I've had a dream. We were in a field and you basically bowed down to me and his brothers got furious. So, and the reason I say we're going to look at that a little bit more detail, for a very long time, I thought that in the first part of the, in, well, the first part of the second part of this talk, I always thought that when Joseph saw his brothers for the first time, that came to pass. But through further studies, I discovered that that didn't happen. It only happened the second time when the brothers came. And we're going to elaborate on that a little bit more. And then the cupbearer and the uh, chief baker had a dream. Joseph interpreted for them. And for two years, Joseph served in jail under Pharaoh. And then only after two years, got called when Pharaoh had a dream. Now, one thing that stood out was that the humility of Joseph that he had when Pharaoh decided, when Joseph told Pharaoh his dream, and Joseph said, Pharaoh, you have to appoint someone who can do this and this. And then Pharaoh, seeing that the humility of Joseph and that he knows what he's talking about, decided to appoint Joseph. And that's where we ended off last time. So let's go back and start in. Genesis. We're going to start in Genesis 42. But one thing I want to um, just clarify a little bit is that I touched on the last time, and that is where Joseph had two sons. The first one was Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forgotten all my hardship and all my father's house. He does not. This does not mean that he forgot about his father. He just forgot all the bad that had happened to him and he decided to move on. Now, Joseph named his son that in the reason to remind him of what he had, but also to remind him that he need to move on. You can't dwell on the past. You can't get stuck on something that bad that happened to you in the past, especially if you want to move forward. It's difficult to move forward if you keep on holding on to the bad that happened to you. And then the second one was Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. God used a single person to mold into someone he will need when his people were in trouble. And we're going to look at that at the end of this um, part two series. And that's we're going to look at when his people are in trouble. So in Genesis 2, we start reading about. Um, the first dream in verse 1 to 5, when Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there, that we may live and not die. So 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen on him. Now, when I 
when I came across this and I decided, okay, let's do a study on Joseph because there must be something more that we can learn from Joseph. It dwelled on me that the last time Jacob sent his sons out, one of his sons, one of his favorite sons didn't come back. So now here, J Jacob get, tells his other sons, go to Egypt, go buy food there or else we all will die. But he kept one of his other beloved sons with him. He kept Benjamin at home. In verse 6, Joseph's first dream came to pass. His brothers will bow before him. But that was my first thought. With further study, I came to the point that this was only the start of the dream that we read in Genesis 5, verse 8, 5 to 8. Genesis 37, verses 5 to 8. The first part was only 10 brothers. And I would like to say that all 12 brothers were together when he told them about this dream. Now, me personally, I think they would have been together as, a, as brothers would be somewhere having, doing something where Joseph then decided, listen here, guys, I had this dream. Let me tell you about it. Oh. So that's why the reason I think all of them were together, if Joseph would have been there, Benjamin would have been close by Joseph's side, especially because we can't read of anything where they were, they were in the fields or they were somewhere. So something tells me that they would have been at home when this came out. Um, about his dream. But let's continue with chapter 42. When Joseph saw his brothers, he started speaking to them harshly in verse 7 probably the same manner his brother spoke to him when he told him about his dream and just in general. Now, one thing that I can, when I, when I saw, when I did this study, we're going to cover a little bit more detail a little bit later on. I believe that God hardened his brother's hearts in a, such a way that they wouldn't recognize him. Now, if you go, if you don't see your brother or your sister for 10, 15 years, when you see them for the first time, you know, okay, this, listen, this is my brother. And the reason I say that is why did only Joseph recognize his brothers? Why didn't they recognize him? Just something to think about. And then when Joseph saw them, he spoke harshly to them in the same manner that they would have probably speak and spoken to him before throwing him into the pit. And just in general, but you're such a dreamer. How do you think we're going to bow before you? And in verse 10, the brothers told Joseph that they are his servants. Imagine how Joseph would have felt hearing those words. We are your servants. We are not spies. Seeing his brothers and hearing that word in verse 11, when his brothers told him that they were honest men, he probably felt mad, but forgotten his, but he forgot about his past. He could push that would have put, he could have pushed the anger aside. Imagine hearing those words, we are honest men. And you know for a fact that listen, these were the guys trying to kill me not too long ago. These were the people, my own brothers, my own relatives, that's busy selling me into slavery. Imagine how strong Joseph would have been, needed to be to stay calm under that circumstance. And that's why the first part was the molding phase. God used Joseph. He molded him for all these things that is going to happen or that, are gonna, you know, that is going to happen in the future. Now, let's get back to Joseph. Um, you could put your anger aside, like I said, for... For he was full of God's glory. He, whatever he did was according to God's plan. Joseph needed to find a way for, so like I said, this was only the first part. So now Joseph needed to find a way to get all the brothers together in order for the first dream to be fulfilled. That's just my interpretation. I know there's a lot of people out there that see it a little bit differently. But for tonight's sake, let's go with that idea. And so Joseph had to make a plan to see how is he going to get his younger brother there as well. So he said, you aspires. And after a while in verse 15 to 20, he says, I will keep one of your brothers here 
And when you bring your brother, youngest brother to me, I will know that you are honest men and I will let your brother go. Joseph then put them all in jail for three days. Now, the number two and the number three in this, in, in this story comes up quite a bit. Another, that's another similarity between the story of Joseph and then the story of Jesus. All the brothers were put in jail for three days. Jesus was on, in the grave for three days. But we're going to look at, in um, the third study, we're going to look at all those comparisons between Joseph's story and then the story of Jesus. I personally think, well, if it was me, I would have had fun throwing my brothers in jail, especially for three days, and just let them be there. Especially all the things that they did. If someone did it to me, I would have probably not just throw them in jail, but hey, that's just me. Joseph, at least, was much more content with the things he had, and he had God's plan in him, in his mind. I'm sure that they can see some similarity here between Jesus and Joseph, Joseph and Jesus' story. But in the third, but in verse 21 to 23, we read, Then they said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother. In what we saw. But then they said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother. In that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, did I not tell you not to sin against the boy, but you did not listen. So now here comes a reckoning for his blood. So immediately they think, okay, because of our brother, this has come upon us. I wonder why they thought that. Surely there must be some link that they could tie up. Now, this is one of the best lessons I learned and hope that I will also take away, you will also take this lesson away. We do, not, we do not know anything and everything of other people's lives. So do not bear a grudge about something you do not know. And let me just clarify that a little bit more. Joseph could have thought that, listen, all my brothers wanted to kill me without knowing that Reuben wanted to save him, he would have thought, everyone wants to kill me. Instead, Reuben wanted to save him, but he, not, nothing happened of it. And before Reuben can save him, he got saved into slavery. So Joseph would have held this grudge against all his brothers, but through the working of God, he could put it aside and clear his mind, knowing that whatever happened to me, We'll see that a little bit later on as well, was God's plan. Um, okay, so I believe this would have been the start of Joseph's heart turning soft from his brothers. He held a grudge for so long, and after finding the truth, he started having peace with his brothers again. Joseph talked to his brothers again in verse 24, and bound Simeon in front of them and gave order for their bags to be filled and also an extra to be added for them for the road. Also turning them, um, returning their money to them. So a little bit further, we're going to see how Joseph would have dropped a little bit of hints here and there in order for his brothers to maybe realize, listen, this is our brother. There's a reason for all these things that's happening to us, but it's mainly going to be in chapter 45 and uh, 44 and 45. So in verse 27 to 28, they hid home, but when they stopped for the night, one of the brothers opened his sack and found him his money there. He told his brothers and their hearts sank, saying, what is God doing to us? Amazing how all of the guilt started coming back now. When they told the father of this, he told them that, you are robbing me of my children. Almost like he knew um, of what they did in verse 36. Now imagine you as a parent or a sibling or something. You, you've got one child that you loved so much. The previous time you sent them out with these 10 brothers, he didn't return. 
now you ask him again and say, listen, or someone ask you, listen, we need to go again. We need to go get our brother Simeon back. We need to take your youngest son, your youngest blood with us in order for us to get fed. And from what I could see is that this would have taken quite a while. Because if there were 10 brothers, all their bags filled with grain, that would have lasted quite a while. And that's when, in verse 37, we see Reuben trying to save the situation again by saying to Jacob, you can take my two sons and kill them if I don't bring back your son. Reuben, in, in his thinking, was sad that he could not save Joseph, but he was very sure that you will be able to protect Benjamin, but Jacob refused. Now let's turn to chapter 43 and start looking at how the story unfolds and where Joseph starts giving little clues, but also the see the fight between the family members of, am I going to send my younger son or are we going to die? So we are not sure, like I said, how long this has been between the two visits, but in this chapter, we will be able to see how Joseph is dying to tell his brothers that, is he, that it is him. Up to a point where he can't take it anymore. But before we get there, let's first go back to have a look at a little family fight. In verses 1 to 7, you can read the whole chapter a little bit later. We can read about his family fight, going back and forth. If Benjamin is going with us, we're not going. Benjamin is the key. We have to take the boy. Until Judah said, um, said, send the boy with me before, before we all die in verse 8. I'm going to pause there a bit to, just to let you think about what you've known from Joseph up to now. And just to dwell on the first, first eight verses of this chapter 43. And the reason I'm doing that is because from now, it has been quite a slowish story, but from verse 11 of chapter 43, it starts getting fast paced with a lot happening. So verse um, 11 to 14, then their father Israel said to them, if it must be, then do this. Put some of the best products of this land in your bags and take them down to the man as a gift. A little balm and a little honey, some spices and myrrh, some pistachio nuts and almonds take double the amount of silver with you for you must return the silver that was put back into the um, mouths of your sacks perhaps it was a mistake take your brother also and go back to the man at once and may god almighty grant you mercy before the man so that he will let your other brother and benjamin come back to me now when the brothers left Jacob, he said, take some of the best products, a little bit of balm, a little bit of honey, some spice, some myrrh. We're going to see at the end of this chapter where Pharaoh does exactly the same. In order for Joseph to get what he wants, um, Pharaoh is willing to sacrifice. The same Jacob here is making sure, maybe if I send all these gifts to the man, he will forgive us and he will let my son come back. From verse 16, we read, um, we start with the next part of our story. Joseph saw his brothers and tell his steward or his housekeeper that he will dine with these men. Now, Joseph's brothers were frightened. They probably felt the same way Joseph would have felt before being thrown into the pit in verse 19 to 22. The brothers went to Joseph's steward and spoke to him about the silver that was in their bags. So here the brothers know, okay, maybe we're going to get punished for the money that came back. Maybe this commander, this high person of Egypt thinks we, we took that money for ourselves. Or maybe it was a mistake and because we didn't bring it back, now he's angry with us. And this was the reason they thought they were in Joseph's palace and told him they brought extra silver. But in verse 23, the steward tells them, that they don't need to be afraid. It is all right, he said. Don't be afraid. Your God, the God of your father, has given your treasures in your sacks. I received your silver. Then, I brought Sim then he brought Simeon out to them. 
the steward took the men into Joseph's house, gave them water to wash their feet, and provided um, fodder for their donkeys. The first dream now has been fulfilled. All the brothers under one roof, not physically bowing down, but knowing that Joseph is in a much higher place than what they are. They know the situation they're in and their life is hanging in this person's hand. Um, then the brothers prepared the gifts for Joseph in verse 25 to 26 and Joseph started asking questions. Now this is where you're going to see how desperately Joseph is trying to tell his brothers, listen, it is me. The first sign is in chapter 27 when he asked them about their father. Joseph would have seen hundreds, if not thousands of people in the time that they were gone. So how would this ruler know that we don't know? How would he know that about our father? How would he remember about our father? Yes, people can say, yeah, their brother was locked up. But I'm sure Joseph would have thrown a lot of people in jail. And he couldn't remember, he couldn't recall every single person that was thrown into jail while they were being there. And then the second clue, he looked at Benjamin and asked, Is this your youngest brother? You should you told me about. Here, they could have knowing that this person don't know them, they could have had any single person. They could have taken a stranger from the road and said, Listen, here's our brother. But Joseph went to Benjamin and said, is this the brother you were talking about? And then the third clue is the brothers being seated according to their age. That to me is one of the biggest tells where Joseph is trying to tell his brothers, listen, it is me. How, who would have known that to sit them according to their age? Sure, maybe they were tall and short. But a lot of things point to that Joseph, well, obviously Joseph knew exactly what the ages were. So what, how can that be? And then the fourth clue, Benjamin getting five times the normal portions. Why? Because the Benjamin being Joseph's related, relative, his blood brother from the same mother, Joseph said, here's five portions more, four, five times the normal portion for you, my brother. Now, in verse 44, we read about Joseph's silver cup. And here I read a few things as well. But it also taught me a few things about Joseph, about his character, and how desperately he's trying to tell his brothers, listen, you brothers of mine, I am Joseph. I am here to protect you. Okay. So not being able to tell his brothers yet that it is him, he made a plan to see them once again and muscle up courage to tell them. In verse 1 to 6 of verse 44, we read, Now Joseph gave these instructions to the steward of his house. Fill the men's sacks with as much food as they can carry and put each man's silver in the mouth of his sack. Then put my cup, the silver one, in the mouth of the youngest one's sack, along with the silver for their grain, and he did as Joseph said. As morning dawned, the men were sent on their way with their donkeys. They had not gone far from the city when Joseph said to his steward, Go after these men at once, and when you catch up with them, say to them, Why have you repaid good for evil? Isn't this the cup my master drinks from and also uses for divinity? Divinitation. This is a wicked thing you have done. So when he caught up with them, he repeated these words to them. Then the brothers were totally caught off guard. Here they think they left Egypt, everything was fine. They had a nice meal with the ruler, and the brothers are safe, their sacks are filled, so let's go. And that's when they started. In, um, tr so they started to defend themselves, not knowing what this was, that this was staged. In verse 9, if any of your servants is found to have it, he will die, and the rest of us will become my Lord's slaves. Imagine the, 
you not knowing what you said, what happened, you can say, if any of your servants have this cup, you will die and the rest of us will become the Lord's slaves. Imagine the surety they had no, knowing that they did not have the cup. Like I said, not knowing that this was staged. And the brothers were deeply saddened and troubled, loaded their donkeys and went back to Joseph. To number five, he basically tells them, don't you know I am a man that can see the future? Just as he's told two dreams, two, certain, two different dreams at two different times, something that would happen in the future, a big clue. But Judah in verse 16 say, what can we say, my Lord? Judah replied, what can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. We are now, my Lord's slaves. We ourselves and the one who was found to have the cup. Now in verse 6, oh, we're going to look at the sixth clue now. And that is the clue. Why would the person who got the most take the cup? And as well, why didn't they just, when they searched the sack, why didn't they just start with the one closest to them? Why did they have to sit, start with the eldest going down to the youngest? Knowing that the cup was in the youngest person's bag, why did they not just go to the youngest first and get it over with? But they wanted to build this tension up, this, listen, you made a promise that you will protect your youngest brother. And now, he is the one found guilty. What are you going to do now? Okay, so it just does not add up. Judah then tells Joseph about, Joseph about the whole story about him asking about the father and the brother, asking them to bring him to him, and then tells him all that was said. He would rather stay in Egypt than go back home without their brother. Imagine the fear they had for their father, knowing that, or not just the fear, the heartache, knowing that when you go back with his younger son, you will be the reason for his death. That heartache was so bad for them that they decided we'll rather stay in Egypt and let our father think that we're still negotiating than going back home. Without, sorry, with Artie's younger brother. Now in chapter 45, this is where the story gets saucy. Now this is where Joseph just couldn't take it anymore. He just had to tell them. He had to make it known and say, listen, you guys, I'm your brother. I am here. Just like I predicted in my first dream when you laughed at me, when you mocked me, when you said you're going to kill me. I still love you. I am here to help you. So let's go to chapter 45, where Joseph makes himself known. In the early verses, we see that Joseph could not hold it in anymore and tells everyone to leave his palace. When he told his brothers that it was him, he wept so loud that the word got to Pharaoh. Now, for Pharaoh to hear this, or the people to hear this outside Joseph's room, he wouldn't have just cried normally. Those would have been thick walls made of big boulders, big rocks, a lot of mortar. So these rooms would have been quite soundproof. But yet, word got to Joseph, uh, to Pharaoh, Joseph, your servant is crying. Now let's go back to the brothers. When Joseph told him that, listen, I am your brother, they were terrified. In verse 3, he also asked when he asked about his father, I believe God would have blinded, the brother. like I said in the beginning, God would have blinded the brothers a bit so they could not see that this is their brother Joseph. Maybe there would have been some resemblance or one of them might have picked up, listen, this is our brother Joseph. That's might where all the guilt would have started coming in. But like I said, if you don't see your rel any relative of yours for quite a while, 10, 20 years, when you see them again for the first time, you would normally recognize them. From the age, from about 16, 17, people don't, their facial expressions don't change that much until they reach 40, 50, 60 years old. Um, 
<clears throat> so if he recognized his brothers immediately, surely his brothers should have recognized him as well. In verse 4, he tells them, come close to me. And when they did, he again said, I am your brother whom you sold. So twice here, he has to confirm to them, I am your brother. Again, the number two comes up. Two dreams, two different people, two different scenarios, two years in prison, twice I'm your brother. Come back to me twice in order to buy food. And now do not be distressed in verse 5 to 7. And do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the world and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by great deliver by the great by a great deliverance sorry and again joseph knowing what that it was god who sent him in verse 9 now hurry back to my father and say to him this is what your son joseph says god has made me lord of all egypt come down to me don't delay you shall live in the region of goshen and be near me you your children and grandchildren your flocks and your herds and all you have, I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all you who belong to you will become destitute. Now, for a while here, I knew Joseph who had a lot of power, but in what we're going to read now is how much Pharaoh trusted Joseph as well not just trusted him, but respect him and wanted to keep Joseph with him, that he sent his own things, his own possessions, giving Joseph's family a part in Egypt to live on one of the best lands, just to make sure that Joseph is happy. Because a happy ruler means that he will be able to rule accordingly. Okay, so... Joseph's telling his brothers to go home and tell their father and family of all that you have seen and witnessed. In verse 17, Pharaoh hears about this and tells Joseph again to bring his family to Egypt. And I, Pharaoh, will give them the best land in Egypt. So here, like I said, we can read about how highly Pharaoh thought about Joseph. Everything Joseph has done for Pharaoh Pharaoh would have repaid him over and over again, making sure that Joseph is satisfied, Joseph is happy, in order for him to rule over his land. Um, so uh, highly Pharaoh thought of Joseph to give his family some of the best land in Egypt. Pharaoh even sent his own carts along to speed up the process, and eliminate any form of doubt, that his family might have had or any excuses. Imagine only the brothers went home saying, this is what happened. Joseph is alive. We need to go back to Egypt. Jacob would have thought, what are you guys on? This is a lot of things to pack up. This is a lot of things we need to move in order. We can't just decide today and tomorrow we leave. There's a lot of things that happen. Now, Pharaoh would have known that situation as well. And that's why I said, here's some carts, here's some donkeys, here's food, extra food, go. Um, okay, and in verse 20, he says, never mind about your belongings because the best of all Egypt will be yours. So Pharaoh here again tells Joseph, tell your brothers, tell your family, don't even worry about your belongings. Just come to Egypt. The best of the best of what we have will be yours. How amazing is that knowing that if you put your mind toward, toward God and to do the things you want to have done, not hesitating, not thinking, okay, what, maybe I can do it a little bit better. Maybe if I do it my way just sticking to God's plan, he will bless you abundantly. And then Pharaoh making sure that Joseph can be, re be reunited with his family. 
Now, in closing, as their brothers were wait, making their way home, Joseph said to them, listen to, oh, listen, sorry, listen to what Joseph says in verse 22. To each of them he gave new clothes, but to Benjamin he gave 300 shekels of silver and five sets of clothing. And this is what he sent to his father, 10 donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt and 10 female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and other provisions for their journey. And in verse 24, he tells his brothers, don't quarrel along the way. I'm sure he would have said that what is done is done. Nothing can change. Nothing can happen to what, what we've done. So forget about it. Forget about what you've done. Just move on. And that's what exactly what we need to do as well. That's what the story of Joseph teaches us is so many times in the haste of things, we do something out of a rush. And most of the times it doesn't add any benefit to us. So why dwell on the past? Let's just move forward. There's so many more things that can happen if we just keep moving forward. And now this is where we're going to end off is when the brothers got back to their father and told him what had happened, he was amazed and didn't believe them. He might've been in the tent arriving. And then when his brothers, the brothers ran into him and said, father, father, you would never believe what happened. Your son Joseph is alive. He's the ruler of Egypt. And he's asking us to come to Egypt. He would have been, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. what did you guys do on the road? And then when he went outside and saw everything that was sent, that is when he believed. And that is exactly what we do as well. We hear all these marvelous things about the Bible. We hear it, but we don't believe it. We first need to see something before we believe. Why do we do that? In the next chapter, in the next few chapters in the next class, we're going to see about what made Joseph such a good ruler. And that's where we're going to end off tonight. Thank you.